Good evening, World Outreach Revival Center. Can we that are here give Jesus a big shout of praise? Ah, you sound good. Amen. It's good to have you tonight. Those that will be joining us online, we're going to just invite the Holy Spirit here tonight and uh, just expecting something good from the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. The opportunity to come to your house. The opportunity to hear your word. And the opportunity to share your word. Lord, let your anointing be on Caleb and flow through this house as we sing, as we celebrate you, as we worship you, as we love you. We give you this service. Lord, touch each one online, those that are here and those that are on their way. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. 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 Come on, Caleb, let's worship the King.
above all names, Lord.
worship Him. Just let Him know how much He means to you. My God, my God. Lord, you're my closest friend. Jesus. Jesus. tonight. Come on, give him a hand of praise. Just sitting in his presence, enjoying his, his goodness. We love you, Lord. Oh, Bridget, if you don't mind, put those lights on back there on the right side. Amen. Can we give Caleb a hand if you don't mind? Good job. Beautiful. Beautiful uh, worship tonight. Well, I have an expectancy of something about to happen in the kingdom of his spirit. Uh, something very powerful, and I'm just referring to our church at the moment for a breaking through of the spirit of God um, in the body. So something, just get ready, just get ready. Uh, 
something the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me on. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says he, he calls those things that are not as if though they are. It's an interesting scripture. And this, this year, I shared this Sunday, the Spirit of God has begun to deal with me about a level of faith that is beyond where my faith has ever been. And in that level of faith, he's saying, I want you to believe and to declare the things that are not as if though they are in your life. And I shared this, and I'll just share this just for some information. This has got nothing to do with my message. Uh, but Sister Tammy and I had a, a goal set for December 31st. And it did not happen. It was something we prayed about, and we didn't see it manifested. We saw it partially, but not completely. And so I was a little bothered. Excuse me. So I went to the Lord, and I said, I don't understand. I really believe you were going to do this by the 31st. And this is probably uh, just a week or so ago. And he said to me, basically, David, how do you know I haven't already done it? When I give the command for the thing to be done, that's when it's done. And he said, you're looking at what you see, not what you can believe for in my promise. And I said, wow. So from that point, I told Sister Tammy, I, I began to thank him for doing a miracle for us in December 31st, even though I'm coming to the end of January. And it's a strange place. I've never done that before like that. But he began to just say to me, when I give the command, that's when the answer is done. It's my timing of when you see it, but if you know I commanded it, it's done. Amen. Can anybody grab that? Can yes, you say amen? Word. Okay. Praise the Lord. That was just a free thing I wanted to throw out. I want to share something with you um, that's that's really in my spirit. Um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, or if you're online, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But when's the last time you you cried? Not over your circumstances, not over a family member, but over the unsaved souls of the world. Don't answer the question. I found myself <clears throat> walking through life as a Christian, but, but not finding myself in brokenness for the unsaved. And... I mean, somebody join me. How, how many can raise your hand and say, I've been there? Maybe not right now, but I've been there. Not having a brokenness for the unsaved. Anybody with me? Okay. I feel better. <laughs> I'll throw up on myself. And I've been talking to the Lord about this place of intimacy, about his heart, about where we're at with all the prophecies that are going on. And, um, you know, before the election, there was the prophetic words online that were just flooding it. And now they're almost hammering stronger like a, another hammer. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, we're in a war, we're in warfare, and they're prophesying and prophesying and prophesying. And I'm not going to say the prophets are wrong or the prophecies are wrong. But I was walking through my house today, and uh, I was looking for something I can't remember, but I, I came across something on Facebook. It was a picture, I told Sister Tammy, of a, uh, a very attractive young woman. Um, and she was made up in a way that made me look at her and say she has no idea who she is. Uh, and I'm not judging the way people put makeup on or facial piercings or anything like that. But I'm saying when I looked at her, I walked through my house crying. 
And my, I went to my office. I just sat there. My heart began to weep for people that have no idea. I mean, think about this. For each one in this room, I know everybody here. You guys are all safe. In your worst situation, you're better off than those that have no hope. Think about that for a minute. Your worst day would be their best day. Do you ever think that way? I have many times. Our worst day as a Christian is better than their best day as a non-Christian. And so I'm looking at this young woman, and she became symbolic to me of our society. And it really shook my spirit. I, I just sat in my office talking to God and saying, Lord, our focus is being sucked into other things. It is. It's so easy, um, especially today. Let me tell you the news today. I'm watching uh, Fox News, just a clip, and they're trying to push a new agenda. They are, whoever they are, because I don't know who the they really are, but there's somebody out there that's a they that keeps doing everything. Babies will no longer be called babies. They're going to be babies. This is the, a new agenda. They don't want to call babies babies. They want to call them babies because they don't know who they are gender-wise until they're four years old. And at four years old, that's when the medical and psycho people to me have decided a child can decide their gender at four. And then they can say, I'm a boy or a girl, according to their desire at four years old. And I'm thinking, dear Jesus, where, what? This is nuts. And you don't want to read the comments because everybody on there is just cursing and mad. And what, you know, I mean, it's just like crazy. It's so easy to get our focus sucked into those things that we're seeing. It's so easy to get our focus sucked into the prophetic words. It's so easy to get our focus sucked into our own problems with life and coronavirus and all of the things that are going on. It's so easy to get sucked into the political realm right now with the, the, the new things that are being passed and, and executive orders. It's so easy to get sucked into all of this weirdness, the violence that's rising up in all the different people. It's so easy to get sucked into the mindset, I better get some guns, and I better get some food, and I better get some water, and I better be prepared. It's so easy for that to become the full focus of our life. Are you with me? Amen. And the Holy Spirit said to me, where's your focus? And he had me put that down for the message tonight. Because here's where we live. We live in a society that has no clue who they are or why are they even here. This is the world we live in. This is the most confused world. Time, uh, culture, generation that I've ever seen in my life where they're literally four-year-olds are going to decide what gender they want to be for their life. And the commentator said to the lady, so tell me what else important decisions you trust a four-year-old to make. And he labeled, I mean, do you trust them to go out drinking? Do you trust them to, you know, drive a car? Do you trust... And he's trying to make light of the woman and make her feel foolish, but he didn't do it. Here's her words. This is just a very small thing. What are you talking about? Oh, my goodness. For a system to say we're going to change babies to babies, and when they're four they can decide what gender they want to be, 
because that's when they're mature enough, my head's ready to explode. And the list goes on. And I wrote this down. We live in a society that has no clue who they are or why they're even here. That's where we live. And as I saw this young woman, I want to go to the book of John uh, chapter 4 real quick. And this is very familiar to everybody, I'm sure. Probably uh, almost memorized for some of you. But I saw this picture of this young woman. And it wasn't that she was like all uh, tattooed or pierced up. She had beautiful long flowing hair. Her eyes you know, had a, a, a good amount of makeup on them, and then the little lines came out. She had some thicker lipstick and a nose that was completely pierced from one side to the other. And there's nothing really bad about what I saw, except when I looked at it, it became symbolic of a world that says, I'm trying to figure out who I am. I'm trying to figure out. I mean, we just had a young boy teenager, 17, killed six people in his family, shot him. We just had another one where he stabbed some people. The youth are going crazy right now. I don't know if you follow the news, but the teenagers and uh, young teens are going bonkers. They're becoming very violent. They're striking out. They're murdering. Uh, uh, Moss Point right now is at an all-time high of criminal activity and people getting killed every day. Moss Point, Mississippi. And a lot of it is youth. It's youth going crazy because they're under this pressure cooker of our system. You as a Christian and I as a Christian know this has been one of, well, 2020 has been one unbelievable year and now 2021 is seeming like I'm going to match that. I believe it's not going to, but the fact is we've been in the pressure cooker of life, and it doesn't take too long for children, if they don't have something to hold on to, to start snapping. You pull them out of school, they can't go to school. I, I, I was talking with some of the men about my grandson, um, Caden, he opted to do uh, the, the computer school. And so he could work, didn't realize how weird it would make everything. They don't have a senior type year. Everything is messed up. Tonight, uh, our other grandson is playing for the state championship, I think, to, the finals to go to the state, soccer in Jackson. And here's the announcement to all the parents. You can't come. They're going to play in an empty stadium because the coronavirus is on too much of an uh, uh, increase in Jackson. This messes with people. And you have children and you have teenagers that are falling prey to the pressure of today. You have adults. I believe the mental disorders right now are at an all-time high. Suicides are extreme. That's the world we live in. And for us as Christians, I don't know what you had to do, but I had to put on my big boy clothes. I'll put it to you that way. So I could press in and say, God, I'm going to survive this thing. Is anybody with me? Because this has been a tough season. And I think the church worldwide has gone through a lot of different things. The body of Christ has been shaken. Everyone's been shaken. Our governments have been shaken. There's so many conspiratorial theories and things out there. We don't know what truth is anymore. We have no clue what is true and what is false. Now we got Bernie Sanders is everywhere in everything, everywhere. That's a joke. I'm thinking, what is going on? We've got 12 foot fences around our White House. Today I saw on the news that they're trying to make, it's a thought that they'll make Washington, D.C. the 51st state, another state. Uh, what, what, what is happening? Our society is going crazy. 
And we're right in the middle of it. And we have people all around us that are clueless and don't have nothing to hold on to. They can snap like that. What do you do when you're under that pressure? I know every one of you. We collapse, we cry, we break, we get angry, we get upset, and then we fall at the foot of the cross. Come on. That's where we go. And we gain our hope from him. So I want to share something with you to maybe help change your focus just a little bit. So we're going to go to chapter 4 of John. I've got two other verses to read. It says, and Jesus said, verse 4, he must needs go through Samaria. Then he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, being tired of his journey, sat on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Now there comes a woman of Samaria, you all know the story, to draw water. And Jesus said to her, would you give me a drink? For his disciples had gone into town to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink? Uh, a woman of Samaria, you guys have no dealings with us. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him or you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. This is a crazy story. And the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with. How are you going to get this living water? She had no clue what he's talking about. Because she's living in a natural realm, he's living in a spiritual realm. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank and his cattle and his children? And Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water in this well will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him is never going to thirst again. And the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He's offering her something that's going to last forever. And I wrote this down in my notes. People are starving. They're dying of thirst for something that will satisfy the need that is deep inside their soul. Now, I, I, I don't want to mix this with the journey of a Christian and the inner healings that God does from the wounds of our journey of life. God is ever healing. He's ever cleaning us. He's ever revealing. Come on. But we know, okay, I'm going through this thing, but God is speaking to me. I'm spending time with him. He's strengthening me, and I'm going to come out on the other side. I know that. Don't mix that up with people that are empty because it's not the same. There are people right now, that's why they are going to all these different uh, genders or whatever the case you may want to figure or dressing insanely. I've seen some outfits that I'm wondering. Uh, I, I'm please, I'm not attacking uh, anyone's clothes. But when I'm walking and my pants are so low, I've got to hold them, and I walk like this. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It, I have to think, why? If it's a trend, okay, but it's a very uncomfortable one. Or some of the other stuff that we do, and again, I'm not talking about uh, trends or culture. I'm talking about why. If I have to cover myself from head to toe with tattoos, the Bible doesn't speak anything against tattoos. I mean, if you want to get one, that's between you and God. But the question you got to ask is, why do I want it? Why do I need it? We have a society that is doing things to fulfill the need inside their soul, the place where they're thirsty, the place where they're hungry, so they can get some temporary satisfaction from the people around them, but they still wake up starving every day. Is anybody hearing me? I, I, I put on a certain thing. I, you know, why, why would you cut a hole in your face 
and be able to stick your tongue out the hole and have tattooed circle there. Explain that to me because it, it, it don't make any sense to me except for you're trying to make a statement. I'm just being transparent. Why would I wear clothes that are just totally on the other end of enormousy? Not that there's something wrong with wearing clothes a different way. But what if I'm a man and I'm going through a crowd wearing a tutu? Something's not right. Yet they are. And so I'm dressed in a, in a female tutu and I'm a grown man with a pot belly. And I'm walking through the town and all I'm doing is I want somebody to recognize me to help fill the void inside of me. Are you hearing me tonight? That's what happens in a lot of these things. Someone said to me one time, can I get a tattoo? I said, just pray about it. Are you getting one so that you can feel cool? Are you getting one so you can fit in? Because if that's your reason, you need to really talk to God about it. Or you're going to get it just because you want it and God says, okay, cool, go get the thing. We're either living our life with Jesus who has filled the void, or we're living our life trying to temporarily fill the void. There are some people that have gone into relationships, multiple relationships. I listened to a testimony of a young woman that came out of lesbianism. She said, I was in relationship after relationship after relationship, trying to fill the empty place inside of me. Nothing worked. Are, are you hearing me? I'm not attacking what people do. Sin is sin. We're not going to go in that direction of the, the lifestyles of people. I'm just saying we are ever trying to fill the void. Isn't it that way when you got saved, when I got saved, God peeled back the, the blinders in my eyes and showed me that you have an empty place inside your soul that started with Adam and it needs filled by me and me alone. Amen. Come on. Nothing we do can fill it. You can have all the money in the world. Multi-millionaire. And you can be a drug addict that ODs and dies. Because you're trying to fill the place. Are you hearing me? Money can't fill the place. The lifestyle of whatever we want to do can't fill the place. Some people spend every day, they just shop, 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 shop. Why? Because they're trying to fill the need. And Jesus said to this woman, I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again. Because it's going to fill that place. You'll still have needs, you'll still have wants, you'll still have journey and battles. But that whole that came from Adam, it will be filled. And once that hole is filled, no matter what battle you go through in life, you can still have an identity in Christ. I may be a disaster this week, but I'm still a child of the Most High God, and He knows the plans He has for me. Jeremiah 29, 11. He's thinking about me, and He's got plans, and I hold on to that. You see, we grab a hold of our identity in Christ. The devil has started from the very beginning saying, I want to do one thing. Listen to me close. I want to steal who they think they are from them. Think about the sin of Adam and Eve. Have one agenda. I want to take on your identity. And it's been that way ever since. The three Hebrew boys, what did they do when Babylon brought them in? The first thing they did is they took away their names and gave them three new names. They wanted to steal their identity. The problem was is they had God in the heart, not in the head. They had God where he belonged. So they could call them the other names all they wanted. But it didn't matter because they knew who they believed in. In the toughest times, and we've been married now 40-some years, we've gone through some journeys. I mean, I did, I'll be at a funeral uh, this Saturday. We did a funeral last Saturday. We did another funeral a couple of weeks before that. Four funerals in a row. This has been kind of some tough times. 
emotionally, but right in the midst of it, I can smile and I can have joy and I can have peace and I can have strength because I know who I am and I know who has me and who I have. I told the Lord when I came up here as we're worshiping, I said, I said, I claim ownership of you and you claim ownership of me. This is so cool. Right in the midst of our battle, we still have him. But the world doesn't. The world does not. So they try to satisfy the need with every single thing they can. And it's magnified more today than it's ever been in our lifetime. Because the system of the world, it used to be there's just a few out there that are whack. And they're just trying to go crazy and do crazy things. Trying to gain an identity. You know, when the hippie world came and I was young, but I was in the midst of all that. They're just trying to get an identity. Somebody recognize me. Free love. Watch us. You know, someone recognized me. Then the drug situation came in. What massive drugs. And man, we're all going to get high. Watch and see what we do. And then Jesus came in with the Jesus movement and said, I'm going to get you out of that mess and I'm going to save you. And he did. And they gained the identity of who they really were. Think about this. How many people right now could you imagine that are either aborted or addicted or bound up in perversion or running with their own agenda that might have a massive call from God in their life that could give them more peace than they'd ever imagined? There's no time. I'll never forget the story, and I, and I don't want to elaborate too much, but Raul Rees was his name. And he was raised with an alcoholic father, would beat his mother, and he told his father when he walked out of the house, if you hit her again, I will come back and kill you. That was their relationship. Threw him out. In school, he went and he caused fights constantly enough that they threw him out of school. He ended up getting a court order to go into the military, Went into the military and then after a season of time convinced him that he was too mentally unstable, so they sent him out. Raul Ruiz then comes back and he's a violent guy. He uh, goes to, uh, learns martial arts, becomes a master in martial arts, opens up a studio, meets a young woman. Big problem. She's a Christian and he's not. Normally that doesn't work out right, but this one did because she had seriously praying parents. And so he marries this girl, and they have a child, and he becomes physically abusive, starts beating her, and he says, if you leave me, I will kill you and our child. He's having an affair with one of his students. His life is a mess. He just liked to hurt people. And one day, he goes home, and his wife is gone. He gets the shotgun out loads it and is pacing in the house back and forth letting the steam roll up inside of him. Getting ready to go find his wife which he believes is at her parents house he's going to go there and do some very bad stuff. Just by chance the TV was on. Old black and white TV back in the, the 60's and early 70's and a preacher was on there talking about Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And this violent, angry man that was so empty on the inside because of the life he had come from finds himself in the middle of his living room floor laying the shotgun down and crying out to this invisible God and asking Jesus to forgive his sins and to come in his life. And the glory of God came in that living room, saved him, set him free and filled that empty spot and gave him a real purpose in life. So when he goes to the parents' house and knocks on the door, they're scared to death because the psycho is outside. But when they open the door, the psycho is now turned into a son of God because Jesus Christ filled the hole that his family had put in there and that Adam had put in there. And now he has a purpose in life. Amen. And he goes back and he breaks off with the woman that he had the affair with. And he takes his uh, studio of... Uh, students and he begins to have Bible study too and one day while he's having Bible study he looks over and his father is there 
And he gives an invitation to receive Christ. And the abuser became born again because the son met Jesus who filled the void of an empty soul. Awesome story. We have a world filled with those people. And you have I've often said one of the greatest depression breakers for Christians is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It'll break it right off of you so fast. You want to know why? Because that's the business of the Father. And I can live life as a Christian, and maybe I don't have a particular ministry, but I, I'm trying to figure out what am I supposed to do. Well, on the journey, we're supposed to be a light in the darkness. Are you with me? So I want to read this again, just this one part, and a couple more scriptures, and I'm going to wrap it up. I never saw this till today. King James in verse 4, chapter 4. And he must needs go through. Samaria, not to Samaria. You see, what God said is, I want you to go in this direction. You're going to go through Samaria. So he's on the journey through the place. How many know that sometimes God is going to bring you through a place? Amen. Are you hearing me? We can preach a whole other message. Man, I've been through hell this year and back. I've been through discouragement. I've been through depression. I've been through all kinds of battles. I've been through the mill. Well, God said to him, go through Samaria. It's a place basically where the Jews don't hang out, by the way. And while he's there, he's still listening to God. When you go through it, you still listen. Are you hearing me? And so while he's there, he says, I'm going to sit down in this well. You guys go get some groceries. And this woman comes up and he shares with her. And I'm going to change all the wording. Ma'am, woman, I know you're empty on the inside. You've been married five times. As a matter of fact, you probably keep up with the years you've been alive by the husbands you've had. And the guy you're with, you're just living with him now. And you're empty on the inside and your heart is hurting. But I'm here to give you water that you can drink and you will never be thirsty again. It'll be alive inside your soul and it will change everything. You see, he knew he had the answer. Pretty simple. I want to go to uh, chapter 6. 33 to 35. Two more scriptures and we're going to wrap it up. Chapter 6. I think the church as a whole, I'm talking worldwide, not all the church, but a large portion of the church has forgotten the world is empty. Are you hearing me? When my mother and I, years ago, we, uh, she was doing a Bible study, and we would do a regular, you know, and we would talk about so many things God would show us. And I remember in one of the Bible studies, we were speaking about the unsaved Christ person. And we we're all born out of being God's sons and daughters from Adam. But that part of God is kind of like in a coma inside of us. That was our best description. That part of God is dead. The, the knowledge, the, the revelation, the spirit man is buried underneath all the sin and the life. And it's not alive. And I said to her, I wonder when you walk up to somebody that's unsaved and you start talking, if the spirit inside of them is saying, please talk. Starving. I want to come alive. Please tell them about Jesus. We begin to think, 
I wonder if every unsaved person has a spot inside of them that is crying out to be resurrected, to be brought to the new birth, to be brought alive. I just wonder. You see, the world has an emptiness in them, and they're starving. And they're trying to fill that void with anything and everything. And it's not working. And now we see it more than ever. Okay, I want to read this. John 6, verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. What does that mean? He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. He's saying, I came to fill the hunger and the thirst inside your soul. That's the whole purpose. I don't know about you. We've, we've led many to the Lord over the years. And it's quite an amazing event to see someone's life turn around. A grown man that walks in with darkness covering him and he walks from an altar and he is like someone turned the light switch on. And he says, wow, I didn't know he loved me this way. Very powerful. John chapter 7. We're going to go to verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You have a river inside of you. So what does the devil say? If I can distract, if I can discourage, if I can keep them occupied, if I can keep their focus, the river will just start laying dormant and be stagnant. And there will be Christians that are discouraged. I'm going to say this. Every Christian in the last, I don't know, 50-something years of my serving God, I never met one anywhere, ever, that on a regular basis shared the gospel and was discouraged, was beat down. There's something about it. I mean, they tell you right now, if you go work out, you will have dopamine pumping in your body. It's a uh, 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 chemical that makes you happy on the inside. So you run a mile, you feel good about yourself, but it's temporary. How much more when you just stop and say, hey, can I tell you Jesus Christ loves you? Get out of my face. I don't want to hear what you got to say. But Jesus does love you, and I just wanted to pray for you. I don't care. I don't care. You're a fanatic. Go die somewhere. Leave me alone. But just tell me Jesus loves you, and you walk off. And you're like, oh, God, I feel so bad. No. Because you've done what the Spirit of God wants. You have spiritual dopamine pumping through your veins. And you said, God, this is somebody else. Who do you have for me today? I told the Lord, I said, the other day I was praying, I said, God, we need the word of knowledge so strong in this day and age. Amen. Now, here's what the word of knowledge is. You're sitting there, you're at a restaurant, you go to IHOP, and you're just sitting there eating, and the young lady or young man's coming and serving your table. And you just, because it's in you, under your breath, you start saying, God, is there something about them that I can say that will help them? Do you have a word for them, God? Or do you, do you want me to pray for them? Or do you want me just to be silent? Because you don't have to witness to everybody. You just got to listen. And what if you're just sitting there and you, you're just minding your business, but you're being a Christian, and the Christian is, I have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, and he says to you, compliment her, sure. Tell her she's got a pretty smile. And so you're just sitting there and you say, what? So she walks up and you're sitting there and you say, look, I'm just sitting here praying for you. God just said, tell you that your shirt is pretty and you have a great smile. 
And all of a sudden her eyes water up with tears because that was a place of great contention and she's trying to fill the emptiness. You understand? This is how it works. And you walk from that place on a spiritual level that you didn't have before. And you say, man, God is good. But the less we share the gospel, the less we try to fill the void for others, the less we minister to somebody, the more we get refocused, the more we get drawn into our own things that are all real, the more we pass through places and don't stop to rest and hear what God says. Did you hear me? But God, this has been a rough week. Stop in the middle of the week and sit down and say, God, did you want to use anything during this week for your glory? Might shock you. Might shock you. I'm getting to the place in my life. I, I nothing. Everything that happens, I'm saying, are you going to do something with that guy? Now I haven't mastered this. Don't think I have because I'm just growing right with everybody else. I mean, this last year took us for a loop. We're just trying to redo, figure, and uh, thank God for Sister Tammy uh, hearing the Holy Ghost to say. You need to stop and work in the church office because I don't know that I'd have survived this past year without her being in that office. She knew God said, stop and work. It's amazing, the timing of God. But the tire's flat on my trailer. It's sitting in Nicholson right now. The one tire is completely flat. And instead of looking at the tire, oh, man, a tire's flat and it's a bald tire. Maybe just say, Are you going to do something with that? Is there a purpose? There is teaching. Do you understand? You carry. When I say you, I'm talking about us. But I, and I, I'm very careful to say you or we. I'm very careful to do that because I don't want you to think I'm at another level elevated up here and you're you and I'm you know, this high person. But I really felt like God said use the word you so you can grasp online here what he's saying for all of us. We have to come to that place of saying, God, you're bringing me through things. Is the Bible saying the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord? Does the Bible say his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path? Does the Bible say he'll never leave us, nor forsake us? Does the Bible say the angels... Uh, camp around about those that fear him. Does the Bible say we're the light of the earth or the salt of the earth? We're all that and more. And so when you go through a place, stop to rest long enough to say, what do you want to do on this journey, God? What do you want to do? And just make you might want to use you. I don't know if I said this the other day. That this, I, I say about Katie, um, he was in the store the other day. Katie has such a heart to, to give. He has to really hear God's voice, so he's learning. So so this lady's card wouldn't work, and um, she had a little bit of groceries or something. Her card wouldn't work, and, and they tried it two or three times, and he told them. He stood behind him, and he said, I'll pay for it. And just randomly, and the lady looks at him and says, he said, I'll pay for it. Don't worry about it. And then she hit the total and it was $58. And he said, Okay, God. <laughs> and they tried the lady's card one more time and it worked. And he said, Shoo. <laughs> but he would pay. And my point is, is, is we got to get, and I'm not exalting him, we got to get the mindset of saying, God. This is a funny story. I, I'll pick on all of them. If Sage is watching, he's going to get on me. This is what I was told, Sage, if you're watching. I don't know how accurate it is, but uh, I think Sage had mentioned to uh, him and Kate and Oliver were out like the two in the morning the other day. I think it was like Monday night, they were out to two in the morning. And Sage said, I think we need to go witnessing. Or I think we need to witness to somebody. And, and Katie said, well, why didn't you? And Sage said, well, because I felt like God wanted you to. <laughs> that is so funny. And I think he 
this one. And well, maybe God will tell me. But the willingness is there. And guess what? The next night, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know, the next night, um, could have been, I don't know what night it was, but it was like a couple nights ago. It might have been on the weekend. Sage texts me and says, we're witnessing to a guy right now. And he said, there's no Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's just Jesus in heaven. And, uh, and so, and he invited him to church, so they may be here Sunday, him and his wife. But, uh, but they had a good time ministering to the guy. I, I want you to know something. When we open that door to realize we are the one carrying the answer to the void of so many people. And you know, here's the reality, and I'm closing, is you know, I'll just pick for a minute, but Mary, you can speak to somebody that Brother Ronald maybe never would, or, you know, Sister Tammy never would, but you can speak to somebody. You know, Bridget, you and Ronnie can speak to somebody. Shyla, you can speak to somebody that that won't connect with, with me. And so we all have our part, and it's not that we walk in guilt or fear, we say, God, show me what to do. And then we just do it. And whether it's walking up to somebody and just saying something simple. Let me just say this. Let me close with this. Sunday morning, I looked in the back and I saw Bridget praying for Susie Farson. I looked to the front and I saw Joyce. You know, she had them eyes that was making her way. And she came and prayed for Sage. And the Lord said to me, tell them they're watchmen in the house. That's the job. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, it was so strong, I think, Bridget, we even talked about this, that if you are stuck somewhere, that gift is bound up. So that's why you have to be able to roam. It's pretty simple. It, it, that's what he showed me Sunday. You have to have that liberty to just, just, just roam. Um, and the ministry that goes on in the services for those that do that is, is very powerful. But here's what I didn't know. I didn't know that just prior to that, Joyce was saying, God, have I missed you? I don't know what my position is. I need you to confirm to me who I am as an intercessor. God, confirm to me that I'm doing what you want. She's praying that. I have no clue. I'm standing over here, and the Spirit of God says, tell them they're watchmen in the house, and they're doing what I've called them to do, something like that. That touched her heart. How simple is that word? Just tell them they're watching. You can be sitting somewhere, and it's just like an impression comes in your soul, and you say, that person's a watchman. So you just want, hey, you know what? I'm just standing here, and God said to me, you're a watchman. We don't even know the power in those words, but it's strong. So I want to encourage you tonight, online, here, me, I'm talking to me more than anybody, is let's realize that we are the ones that carry the light and the life that fills the void that's in every human being because of Adam and Eve. It's not because of their lifestyle. It's because they were born that way. And people are trying to fill those voids. Rich and poor and everyone in between is trying to fill the void that is in them because it's the absence of the Jesus that they need that you have. So just say, God, just use me. Just use me. Once you get over the first initial fears of speaking to strangers, it gets exciting. But you just got to break through the crust of it and do it. Amen? Amen. Everyone's thirsty. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for each one that is here. Lord, I pray for each one that is here, but I pray for me. I want to share your gospel. I want to bring the light to a young person that is filled with violence or whatever, God, because they don't know who they are. One that's confused, not knowing what gender they might be, God, that Father, once they find their identity in you, they can have an identity in themselves. Lord, that we can speak into their life and break the spirit of self-hatred, God. 
So, Father, I pray for each one in the building, and I pray for me. I pray for those online, that we will be lights to the lost and dying world. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise?